Over the past week, there's no way you could have missed all of the headlines about a former U.S. intelligence agency insider claiming the U.S. has been recovering alien spacecraft for decades. Now, just a few days ago, I published a summary of the claims made by former UAP analyst David Charles Grush. But here's the thing, since that video went up, he's made even crazier claims. So let's give this story, which may well be the most credible alien cover-up tale of all time, the deep dive treatment, and see if we can't root out all the red flags. I'm Alex Hollings, and this is Air Power. According to a former high-level member of the American intelligence apparatus, the U.S. government has been secretly recovering debris and even entire intact spacecraft of, quote, non-human origin for about 80 years. Now, according to these claims, these efforts have long been shrouded within the Pentagon's most secretive special access programs and have all been about achieving a technological edge over America's adversaries who have secret crash retrieval and reverse engineering programs of their own. It all sounds like the script for another X-Files reunion run, or one of the stories passed around UFO subreddits and Twitter communities that are marred in conflicting claims and discredited witnesses. But this time, it's a bit different. This time, the whistleblower has a name, legitimate and confirmable credentials, other high-level officials who vouch for him, and even a bit of a paper trail. In fact, this story is quickly shaping up to be the most credible and incredible UFO cover-up claim ever to reach the public. But the one thing Air Force veteran-turned-government UAP analyst David Grush doesn't have is proof. Let's dive into the incredible claims of David Grush, the evidence and official corroboration of his story, and what we can expect to come of this. David Grush, now 36, served in the U.S. Air Force before transitioning to the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, or NGA, and then to the National Reconnaissance Office and back again. During his time with the NRO, Grush reportedly served as a Senior Intelligence Capabilities Integration Officer with a GS-15 pay grade, which is pretty close to the civilian equivalent of a colonel. According to Grush, he was the agency's Senior Technical Advisor for Unidentified Aerial Phenomena Analysis and Transmedium Issues, as well as the agency's representative to the Unidentified Aerial Phenomena Task Force between 2019 and 2021. Now, that's the organization that was tasked with investigating reports of what we once called UFOs, but now call UAPs, for Unidentified Anomalous Phenomenon, or unidentified aerial phenomena, depending on who you ask. Now, Grush then transitioned back to the NGA, but stayed within the realm of investigating these unusual sightings, then serving as that agency's co-lead for UAP analysis and its representative to that same task force. According to Grush, the U.S. military has been recovering debris and even entire intact craft of what he says are of non-human origin for decades all while keeping these recoveries a secret not just from the American people, but from Congress itself. This, he claims, has been accomplished by concealing the recovery efforts within, quote, multiple agencies nesting UAP activities and conventional secret access programs without appropriate reporting to various oversight authorities. And if you think that's nuts... It's just the beginning. Grush's extraordinary claims were initially released by an outlet called The Debrief, but in subsequent television interviews he's done with News Nation, Grush has gone on to claim that the United States has even recovered alien bodies in the execution of these recovery operations. I'll go ahead and quote him here. Well, naturally, when you recover something that's either landed or crashed, sometimes you encounter dead pilots. And believe it or not, as fantastical as that sounds, it's true. Now, among Grush's other more incredible claims that were again omitted from that original article is the idea that there's been direct interactions between these non-human craft and U.S. military personnel, interactions that have even resulted in human deaths. 
When asked by News Nation's Ross Coulthart if humans had been, quote, hurt or killed by non-human intelligence, Grush said, well, I can't get into specifics because that would reveal certain U.S. classified operations. I was briefed by a few members on the program that there were malevolent events like that. Now, Grush says that these interactions, operations, and efforts are so clandestine that they've even been withheld from the Unidentified Aerial Phenomena Task Force that was assigned to investigate such sightings. Now, this may all sound like alien life is just only interested in the good old U.S. of A., but Grush actually contends that there's been a secretive arms race going on for decades. As he tells it, the U.S. has been involved in a decades-long, quote, publicly unknown Cold War for recovered and exploited physical material, a competition with near-peer adversaries over the years to identify UAP crashes or landings and retrieve the materials for exploitation or reverse engineering to garner asymmetric national defense advantages. Now, special access programs are where America hides its most secretive defense efforts, with access to any information about them limited only to officials with both clearance and a distinct need to know. In other words, it doesn't matter how high your clearance is, these efforts are hidden from you unless you're a part of them. Sometimes, special access programs can be so secretive that they're largely kept off paper and exist only as the work and verbal briefs shared among insiders. Of course, these saps are genuinely real, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're being used to hide alien life. According to Grush, the DoD's spookiest of spooks haven't been hiding these secrets alone. Instead, American allies and even high-profile defense contractors have all played their part in both recovering these non-human craft and keeping their existence hidden from the public and lawmakers alike. Now, Grush describes these recovered objects as of exotic origin, non-human intelligence, whether extraterrestrial or unknown origin, based on the vehicle morphologies and material science testing, and the possession of unique atomic arrangements and radiological signatures. But here is an important sticking point. According to Grush, he's never been a part of any of these recovery efforts, and he's never seen any of these recovered objects for himself. Instead, he claims that due to his role within the defense and intelligence apparatus, he's been briefed on and read into multiple such programs and has even interacted directly with those responsible for them. I'll quote Grush here. Individuals on these UAP programs approached me in my official capacity and disclosed their concerns regarding a multitude of wrongdoings, such as illegal contracting against the federal acquisition regulations and other criminality and the suppression of information across a qualified industrial base and academia. Now, so far, none of this is particularly unique. We've been hearing conspiracy theories like this since the 1940s. But according to Grush, it's what happened next that ultimately led to his decision to become a whistleblower. You see, after Grush was informed about these covert UFO recovery efforts, he claims that he went and briefed some members of Congress. And at that point, he claims that he became the target of a concerted harassment and retaliation campaign executed by DOD insiders intent on keeping these recoveries a secret. Now, according to Grush, this harassment became so bad that in May of 2022, he ultimately decided to file a complaint of reprisal with the Inspector General of the Intelligence Community. And that's where this story goes, from just being another UFO conspiracy tale to what may be the most credible claim and accompanying paper trail ever to surface about any kind of governmental alien cover-up. Because not only did this complaint of reprisal establish a paper trail and an investigation into his claims, but Grush didn't walk into this process alone. Instead, he hired an attorney. And not just any attorney, Charles McCullough III. Now, these days, McCullough is a senior partner at the well-respected D.C.-based Compass Rose Legal Group, but his background goes way deeper than that. 
McCullough's career includes time spent at the NSA, the FBI, and the DOD investigating misuse of intelligence collection authorities and whistleblower reprisals. And of course, there's also the fact that back in 2011, he was presidentially appointed and confirmed by the Senate to serve as the first Inspector General of the Intelligence Community. I mean, this is like having a complaint about the theory of relativity and having Albert Einstein represent you. Now, of course, this is still not evidence, but it goes without saying that the fact that McCullough agreed to represent Grush does say something about the credibility of his claim about reprisals, even if not necessarily his claims about aliens. And if Grush securing such a well-respected attorney to represent him in these matters doesn't make you raise your eyebrow, you should also know that according to the debrief, in July of 2022, the sitting Inspector General of the Intelligence Community determined Grush's complaint to be both credible and urgent. Of course, the big problem with trying to investigate or report on a story that is marred in the highest levels of DoD classification is that it's pretty tough to confirm all of Grush's claims about his background. Now, there have been some high-level officials to come out and confirm that Grush did hold some of these positions. And, of course, there's a paper trail dragging behind him that does seem to substantiate at least portions of his story. But to be clear, if we're going to take all of Grush's claims at face value at this point, that also means trusting the vetting process of Debrief co-founder Tim McMillan, as well as the story's authors, Ralph Blumenthal and Leslie Keen. Now, if those last two names sound familiar to you, you might note that they're the same folks who penned the explosive 2017 New York Times expose that first revealed the fact that the Pentagon had secretly been investigating these UAP reports coming from within the U.S. military. Now, I was able to confirm Grush's status as an Air Force veteran in a few different ways, including DoD publications from over the years. There's one story about a large-scale war game being held in South Korea in 2011 that lists him as First Lieutenant David Grush, a UFG intelligence duty officer who volunteered to participate in the exercise. Grush is also listed in a copy of the Schriever Sentinel from 2012. Now, that's a local base newspaper out of the Schriever Air Force Base, now Space Force Base. Grush's name is among a list of first lieutenants who are being congratulated for their selection for promotion to captain. Now, of course, the debrief claims to have confirmation of not just Grush's background, but a fair number of his claims as well. But most of that confirmation comes from sources who've asked to remain anonymous or who spoke under a pseudonym, like one intelligence officer who went by the alias Jonathan Gray. But not all of those who vouch for Grush are keeping their identities hidden. Some, like recently retired Army Colonel Carl Nell, have gone on record about the whistleblower's credibility. Now, Nell has a decade-spanning career in military intelligence that you can confirm in any number of ways, and he went on record to say not only did he work with Grush in an intelligence capacity, but that his character is, quote, beyond reproach. I'll quote Colonel Nell here. His assertion concerning the existence of a terrestrial arms race occurring sub rosa over the past 80 years focused on reverse engineering technologies of unknown origin is fundamentally correct, as is the indisputable realization that at least some of these technologies of unknown origin derive from non-human intelligence. Now, I'm going to level with you guys. That's a barn burner of a quote, but it's still just that. A quote, it isn't evidence. And with that in mind, let's delve into some of the criticisms of Grush's story that have surfaced over the past week. Because this story has been met with a great deal of skepticism that is, in my opinion, completely warranted. After all, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And these claims are certainly extraordinary. But when it comes to evidence, so far we haven't seen any at all. Now, in fairness to Grush, he claims that he can't reveal any evidence that he may have in his possession because it's still currently protected by a high level of classification. And you might say that worrying about adhering to that classification while simultaneously leaking this story to the public is sort of a contradiction. But a devil's advocate might contend that that decision could be what differentiates Grush 
who's still in the U.S. and is clearly acting under guidance from expert legal counsel from past whistleblowers like Edward Snowden, who revealed secrets under the guidance of journalists from the Washington Post and The Guardian. Or Chelsea Manning, who did the same, but under the guidance of controversial publisher and activist Julian Assange. In other words, by taking his concerns to an attorney with intricate knowledge of the intelligence apparatus, one could argue that Grush is taking the most responsible approach to disclosing this fantastic tale that he possibly could. Of course, that's assuming any of it is true. And to be fair to Grush, some of the elements of his story that have been called into question are really born more out of confusion about journalistic practices or government bureaucracy, and we can address a few of those right now. Like the idea that Grush's story was passed over by more reputable news outlets like the Washington Post because it lacked merit. Now, Grush's story was reportedly taken to the Washington Post, but one of the story's authors, Ralph Blumenthal, took to Twitter on June 5th to address this narrative. He said, and I quote, To be clear, the Washington Post did not pass on our UAP story. Leslie and I took it to the debrief because we were under growing pressure to publish it very quickly. The Post needed more time, and we couldn't wait. Now, why couldn't they wait has been subject to some debate, but it likely has something to do with Grush's legal proceedings. Another criticism that we can more or less dismiss is the idea that Grush's story must not have anything classified in it, otherwise it wouldn't have been approved by the Defense Department's Office of Pre-Publication Security Review. After all, it's their job to keep secrets from making it to the press, and Grush presented both the debrief and News Nation with documents showing that both his answers and their questions had been cleared by the Office of Pre-Publication Security. Of course, like so much about this story, this point of contention all comes down to the confusing bureaucracy that makes up the Defense Department. The truth of the matter is, a program as secret as Grush claims this UAP recovery effort is wouldn't raise many flags within such a review. After all, they would have to know about it in order to be concerned about it. But further than that, if the DOD were to step in and say, no, you can't provide that answer, or no, you can't ask that question because it could compromise national security, well, that would amount to a de facto acknowledgement that what he was saying is true. And even if you want to attribute the most malicious secret government cabal to this story, the fact that there's an ongoing Inspector General investigation tied to this individual and these claims means you can't just make this story or this person disappear without drawing a great deal of attention. It would just make way more sense to act like it was a nothing burger. And to give Grush's claims as fair a shake as we can, you should know that according to Debrief co-founder Tom McMillan, Grush's use of this review process is in itself indicative only of the fact that this former intelligence officer is carefully ensuring that he adheres to the law to ensure that the investigative process continues unabated. And you can take that for what you will. Now, shortly after Grush's claims hit the media, the DOD's All-Domain Anomaly Resolution Office's spokesperson, Susan Goh, issued a statement making it clear that they had no evidence of any such crash retrieval program. I'll quote them here. To date, Arrow has not discovered any verifiable information to substantiate claims that any programs regarding the possession or reverse engineering of extraterrestrial materials have existed in the past or exist currently. Of course, according to Grush, this is the problem. He claims that this crash retrieval and reverse engineering program has been purposely kept from Arrow as part of the effort to continue operating outside of congressional oversight. Now, to that end, Oversight Committee Chairman, Republican James Comer from Kentucky, has been less dismissive of Grush's claims, stating right from the start that he intends to organize a hearing on the topic. I'm going to quote Oversight Committee spokesperson Austin Hacker from a statement he gave ABC News this week. In addition to recent claims by a whistleblower, reports continue to surface regarding unidentified anomalous phenomena. The House Oversight Committee is following these UAP reports and is in the early stages of planning a hearing. But while some see the decision to have such a hearing as lending credence to Grush's claims, others see it as little more than just due diligence after such an incredible claim has been made by such a credentialed insider. 
So what conclusions can we draw? What's the truth here? Well, the fact of the matter is, despite Grush's resume and reputation, at this point, he's just a guy with a story. Yes, other officials have come forward to vouch for his character and even elements of his claims, but most do so from behind the protective veil of anonymity. These other witnesses, especially those who won't go on record using their names, aren't evidence. They're just other guys telling the same story. Now, that's certainly worth taking note of, but it isn't proof. At this point, skeptics have little reason to believe Grush's story, and believers sometimes need little reason to believe in the first place. One of the biggest problems with our modern social media-based discourse, and the UFO discourse is certainly no exception, is our ability to choose our preferred realities and finding a crowd of like-minded individuals that support that decision. After all, when a government insider claims there's no evidence of alien life, believers are quick to point out that you can't trust anyone from the government. But when an insider instead claims that aliens are here, well, some of those same people will act as though the word of an insider is above reproach. But to be totally honest, the very same could be said for the other side. Many are so eager to dismiss the seemingly incredible that anyone, regardless of background or credibility, that suggests things may not be as they seem must obviously be a fool, a grifter, or both. Some already believe Grush is the guy who will finally open the dams of disclosure for good, forcing the world to acknowledge the reality of aliens on Earth. Others believe he's been the victim of a mole hunt that fed wild information into the Arrow offices to see who couldn't be trusted with real secrets. And others see him as a con man, leveraging the twilight of his government career to score 15 minutes of fame and a second career on the book and UFO speaker circuit. But the fact of the matter is, at this point, what you believe about Grush is about where you draw the line between the incredible and the unbelievable. Because Grush isn't the first guy to show up with a crazy story about aliens. He's not the first insider with access or respected credentials. He's not the first to spur inquiries, the first to drive headlines, or the first to have respectable officials vouch for his character. But if Grush manages to actually be the first to back up his extraordinary claims with equally extraordinary evidence, well, then I'll be first in line to eat crow, and welcome our new alien neighbors to NATO. Because if they've been watching any Earth news lately, they probably won't have much interest in teaming up with Russia. And on that ends yet another edition of Air Power from Sandbox News. I'm Alex Hollings. Make sure you swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for all the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. If you got anything out of today's video, make sure to click like and subscribe and leave me a comment so I know what I should cover next. And of course, don't forget to tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.